Jordan, I always appreciate your time because, again, I know how busy you are and you've become so popular, well-deserved. So I appreciate you coming back on here. And in general, I want to start with, we're going to start talking off about the defense, but in general, when you look at that top 10, is it hard to figure out who's going to fall out of there? Because it seems like there's about 13 guys who could be top 10 picks. Some of them are not going to be. So how do you look at the top 10 and who might fall out of there? Well, first and foremost, it's always a pleasure being on with you, John. I always enjoy our talks, whether it's about the NFL draft or just life in general. Uh, I can send you one of my best partners in the industry. So it's always a pleasure being back on. But yeah, th this draft is really, really interesting, especially in the top 10, just because whenever you don't have a quarterback at the top, I think it just sends everything in flux. And we haven't had that over the past three years. Three years ago, we had Kyler Murray at the top. Two years ago, it was Joe Burrow. And then last year, we had quarterbacks galore in the top 15 as a whole. So I think that's what makes this draft class so interesting, just because you have a bunch of defensive players at the top. I think you're going to see edge rushers fly off of the board very early on. Aiden Hutchinson, Trayvon Walker, Kayvon Thibodeau is going to factor in somewhere in the top 10, even though everybody seems to be all over the place on him right now. But I still think he's going to end up going inside the top 10. You also have Jermaine Johnson, the second from Florida State, who was a name that caught fire during the backstretch of the year and through the pre-draft process. So I think with these edge rushers, you're going to see them definitely fly off of the board. And then also you have to factor in cornerbacks. Sauce Gardner is the one that I think goes in the top 10 right now. We'll see how Derek Stingley does at his pro day on April 6th on this Wednesday. So I think he's going to perform really well and he's going to enter his name back inside of the top eight or top 10 range too. So you're going to see a lot of defensive players fly off of the board in the top 10. So because of that, like, and you're going to have, couple of receivers go in the top 10, possibly, you know, and you're going to have some offensive tackles go in the top 10. So Washington sitting there at 11, if they wanted to go defense, because there are some attractive defensive options there for them. Who do you think would be the most likely guy? Because one guy, you know, Notre Dame safety, Kyle Hamilton, is he a guy that you think could fall out of the top 10 just because, not because of his talent, but because of other positions that are going in there? Yeah, and this seems like this happens every year. There's always that one guy that falls out of the top 12 to 15 picks just because there's just so many guys at the top and there's a lot of talent that gets pushed down the board. But I think Washington is in a great spot just because they have a need in the secondary, whether it's at corner or even at safety. So if there's a Kyle Hamilton sitting there, or Derek Stingley, or even a Sauce Gardner sitting there, I think it's a no-brainer that you choose any one of those guys. Now, if you have all three of them on the board, that makes things very difficult, yeah. but it's a great situation to be in for Washington. With, let's take a look take a look at those three because with Hamilton what first of all they want that Buffalo nickel the big safety hybrid with what, what Landon Collins did last year they desperately want to fill that role I think that's probably a more important position for them right now than middle linebacker so what could Ham, how would Hamilton fare in that hybrid safety linebacker role and and what do you think about his game well, the great thing for him is that he can wear so many hats in the secondary. He can play in the high post. He can play low safety. Then also he can be somewhat consistent in man coverage, even though there is some questions about him in that area. But I just don't think you want him living and dying in the man coverage world. He's more of your big zone type of safety. And also you can blitz him, whether it's through the middle or off of the edge. So there's so many different areas or so many different ways that he can affect the game. So as far as that Buffalo, that big nickel, I think it would be perfect for it just because of what they asked that specific person to do. And he's much bigger than Landon Collins too. Not quite as physical as far as a tackler, but as far as the length and the consistency and just the wide variety of roles that he can satisfy, I think he would be a, definitely an upgrade at that spot. He also, I know there were questions about his speed, but he also seems to be somebody who plays faster than his speed, than his time speed. And when you watch him, like as someone else pointed out to me, like he's always kind of moving which gives him that momentum to go do you see that and do you think that play you know what do you think about the speed versus the play speed for him yeah he's one of those guys that I thought he would test a little bit better I didn't think he would run in the four sixes or the four sevens I wouldn't say that but he relies on instincts a lot that's why he looks so fast on game tape and he plays plenty fast on game tape too so as far as the time speed it was a little bit worrisome as far as the four sixes and the four sevens. But when you just rely on the game tape and you look at how fast he's playing and then just the instincts that he plays with, he's able to overcome that within games. Um, Derek Stingley, a lot of questions about him. I think he is, some teams are going to love him because the tape from a couple of years ago and other teams are going to say, hold on a minute. What about these last two years? Where are you on with this? And for, let me say this, his tape from two years ago was phenomenal. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, he's, just phenomenal. he's special. If you're just going strictly off of the 2019 tape, six interceptions during his true freshman season, came in and was the leader on that offense, or excuse me, that defense that was loaded with offensive talent like Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson was on that team as well. So if you just think about it, him coming through the door as a freshman, being on that 15-0 and LSU team, he pretty much was at the top of the mountain. But over his past two seasons, the big thing with Derek Stingley has just been the availability with him. He's missed 13 games over the past two years, which is a lot when you're, ta- when you're taking into account, especially taking a cornerback in the top 10. But if you rely on what he showed in 2019 and that's what you believe you're getting from Derek Stingley, I think he can quickly be a top five cornerback in the NFL. He reminds me a lot of Marshawn Lattimore when he was coming out of Ohio State just to paint a picture of what he could be on the next level. So it's not more so nobody has questions about Derek Stingley's ability. It's just the availability with him. When you watch him, I think the thing that jumped out to me, and I'm curious your assessment of him, the footwork for a guy his size and the patience with I guess say when he's in man to not open his hips right away, like how, how unique are his, is his skill set for a guy with his size and length and all that. Yeah, his technique is probably the best that I have seen since I've been doing this, honestly. And he's just so patient in everything that he does. He's never rushed. He never lets the receivers force him into going which way or whatever they want different ways for him to go. He's just able to dictate whatever he wants to do in coverage. And then you couple that with the ball skills that he has, too. He has the ball skills of a wide receiver. He goes up on high points and contests every pass that is in his range. He can even catch balls out of the strike zone, too. So he's just so competitive at the catch point. I'm a big fan of him. He's my top ranked corner going into the draft right now. And I'm really excited to see him uh, on pro day. I think he's going to open a lot of eyes. When you look at him, because he also seems to match the routes of receiver well. When you see that, what does that tell you? And am I, do you think you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, it's just instincts with him. He understands what wide receivers are trying to do. And when he locks in and man coverage, he's just able to dictate and just decipher everything that they're trying to do. And like I said, he doesn't what I like to call take the cheese a lot with wide receivers that are like, a bit exaggerated with their movements he's just fixated on a certain part of their body and he looks at that part of their body and he just isn't rushed at all in this technique and that's something that I wrote down in my notes of where nothing just ever phases him he stays so poised in his in his in his um, backdrop in his, his backpedal I should say he's, he remains fa- he remains in phase a lot of times and he's just his game is just so poised he's just so cool calm and collected in everything that he does what about Sauce Gardner now, this is the guy he's had a tremendous career and I think some people, when you talk to them, might say they would like to have seen him against a more consistent higher level of competition. What do you think? Well, I mean, he's played plenty of guys throughout his year, right? throughout his career. He played Ohio State when he was a freshman, and then he went against Jamison Williams last year. And then also, I wish he would have played in Georgia his sophomore, his sophomore year. He didn't play in that game. So it's unfortunate that we didn't get to see him in that matchup. But he's played against plenty of Power 5 big-time competition going back to the bowl game last year against Alabama, even though him and Jamison Williams didn't match up a whole bunch, you still had plenty of other talented players opposite of Jamison Williams in that game too. So I think he's played plenty of competition, but also he can't control who he goes against. All he can do is just shut them down, whoever teams put on his side of the football. And a lot of teams were shy as far as testing him just because they had so much respect for him. So not only does he have respect of his peers, his teammates and his coaches, but also every team around the country knew who Sauce Gardner, who number 12 was or number one was his final year when they were when they found him on the scout report. And and I think to me, when I hear that, it's also nitpicking when someone because you're trying to separate. Do you like this guy over this guy? And you still might think, well, yes, he'd be really good for Team X, but we like this guy, but a little bit better because maybe there's a little bit more information on him. So I like I take it as a nitpicking kind of situation. What do you like about his skills? Because he is he's a ter- terrific, terrific corner. Well, he just loves the attitude that you have at at cornerback just because I think he tweeted out yesterday, I'm the best player in the draft. I I just love love stuff like that. It's kind of – and I actually include this with when I'm talking in my notes with cornerbacks just because I think half the battle of being good at that position on the next level is confidence just because you have to be confident at that position. And when you think about the elite players at that position, whether it's Jalen Ramsey or Tredavious White or some of these other players around the league, they have that swagger and that confidence that you love to see at the position. They're not 
afraid of what I like to call the bark back at wide receivers. And whenever they make a play, they let the whole stadium know about it. I just love players at that position that are like that, just because you see that swagger and that confidence that they play with. But outside of the swagger, he has the length that you covered at the position, six foot two and a half, right at 200 pounds. He's very physical as far as coming up to tackle when he gets his hands on wide receivers. He's just a nuisance as far as impeding their routes. And then it's just so hard to get around him just because he's so long. And they're not giving up a touchdown in three seasons. That's just an incredible resume that you very rarely ever see from a player at the position. And that length is such a tremendous value, too. When you it's because you play quarterback. So when you know you're throwing against a taller corner, talented and tall, how does that play with your head? Because like I'd imagine like you like you can see a guy who might look open, but because of the length, maybe he's not quite as open. It's just they can have an effect on throwing windows so easily. And even if he doesn't have his head around, he still can stick his arms up and then just what I like what I like to call be competitive at the catch point and fight through the hands of wide receivers. That's something that you see very periodically with him. So it is very difficult for wide for excuse me for quarterbacks to throw around that length, especially when you're talking about those longer type corners that can just have a negative effect on those throwing windows. Going back to safety, because there are a couple other guys at that position. Um, one is the the Penn State safety. I think is Jaquan Brisker. Yeah. What do you think? And I don't, he's not going at 11, but he's a guy that could also fill that Buffalo, Buffalo nickel role here. What do you think of him? And where do you, where would you kind of project him? I like him a lot. And with Brisker, I think he has such an incredible story everywhere he's been. He's been a winner. He actually went to Lackawanna junior college before he got to Penn state, won a college national championship there. He was a team captain on that team. He was a two-time team captain at Penn state as well. So those are some of the traits that you covet, especially when you're talking about a leader on the back end of your defense, like Jaquan Brisker. And he's a player that's gotten better every single year. He has the ball production that you're looking for. He's played high safety. He's played low safety too. And something that I think a lot of people aren't really taking into account with him is that he had a shoulder injury last year so some of those missed tackles or opportunities of where he had to come up and tackle I think that kind of affected him a little bit so you have to go back and look at the sophomore tape to just see how physical he is as far as a tackler I think he showed much more consistency in that area but he has the length that you're looking for at about six foot one um, right at 215 to 220 pounds so he has that size that you're looking for too. So I'm a big fan of Brisker. I think he probably goes late first to early second. Okay. Cause I think he's a guy that would intrigue them if he's there, but you can't take it. You're not going to take him at 11. So I don't know if they, they don't pick again till 47 um, in the pick number 47 in the, in the second round. So I think he may be gone by there, but if he somehow falls, I think that's a guy that would tempt them if they haven't filled that Buffalo nickel roll. Do you see more teams in, in college using those three safety looks that can fill those hybrid safety linebacker roles when they get to the NFL? You're starting to see it a little bit more. And I think Gary Patterson from TCU, when he was the head coach at TCU, he was the one that really started the three safety looks just because you have so many athletes on the back end. And then with these college offenses, everybody wants to go vertical and then just throw and score as many points as humanly possible. So he wanted to figure out a way to incorporate some of these three high defenses just to keep everything in front of him and slow everything down. But the benefit of that is that you get more athletes on the field too. You get some of those lighter personnel, those dime and those nickel looks of where you have an extra safety or an extra corner, even two extra corners at a time on the field. So I think with those three safety looks, you're starting to see that become more popular. But the great thing for that or of that is that you're starting to see better looks from these safeties too. And then again, go, now going back to corner, then I want to get to linebacker and we'll wrap up the defensive portion. But at corner, what's the gap between Stingley Gardner and then the McDuffie in the next level of corners? I don't think it's a huge gap, honestly. And both of those guys are very talented in their own right. But I think overall, this is a really talented cornerback class through about the third round. I think there's a bit of a precipitous drop off after the third round. You're starting to get into more of your nickel types or the ones that just didn't develop the way that you had envisioned for them. But through the first three rounds or through day two, I think this corner class is really, really strong for the most part. But some other guys that could go in the first round, you already talked about McDuffie, Andrew Booth Jr. from Clemson, who's battled some injuries uh, through the pre-draft process. I, I think he could go late first, early second. Um, Kyer Elam from Florida, I think he's one that's not getting a lot of attention right now that deservedly so needs some more attention. I think he's a first round worthy corner. We saw Tariq Woolen from UTSA. We saw his size and then just the way um, he was able to perform at the combine. Kyler Gordon from Washington is another name. And um, 
and plenty of others too. Roger McCreary from Auburn, who's more yeah. than nickel type, he's probably going to have to slide inside on the next level. So if the commanders want to take a receiver in the first round and then come back and take McCreary to satisfy that nickel role, uh, that could be an option for them too. So there's so many different ways that they could go in this in this draft. Who is another safety after the first round that you like who could fill that again? And they also have Cam Curl. And if they don't get the Buffalo nickel, they can always go back and see if Landon Collins would want to come back. But who is another guy maybe after the first round? I know that Georgia has another safety too. That Who's another guy that might be um, tempting who could fill that role for them? Yeah, the great thing about the safety class is that it's loaded through the first two days as well, similar to corner. There's a little bit of a drop off after the first two days of the draft cl- of this draft class. But, uh, excuse me, Jalen Petrie from Baylor is one player that I am fascinated by. He's one of my favorite players overall in this draft class, a little bit smaller than some of the other safeties in this draft class, but he kind of reminds you of Tyron Matthew a little bit. Okay. 18 and a half tackles for loss last year at Baylor, Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. He's just all over the place. Whenever you turn on the film with him, he could play high post as well, even though he didn't do it at all at Baylor. I think he has the traits in order to do so, but you want him sniffing around the line of scrimmage. That's where he really makes a lot of his money. But also you mentioned Lewis Seen from Georgia. Right. He, he's another one that's probably going to have to be a high post safety. You don't really want him a whole bunch in man-to-man coverage, but if he can play that free safety role, I think he definitely can satisfy that. And then there's plenty of others. Dax Hill from Michigan is right. one that probably will end up going in the first round. Kirby Joseph from Illinois is probably more so of your third or fourth round. And also Brian Cook from Cincinnati is another that I like too. All right, so linebackers, last one then. I don't think they take a linebacker at 11 because of how little they use three linebacker sets. But is there a linebacker at 11 that's like Devin Lloyd would be the one guy there? What is your take on him? Yeah, I I like Lloyd a lot. His background is squeaky clean. He has the leadership qualities that you're looking for, a former safety before he converted to linebacker. So he has the athleticism that you look for. He makes plays behind the line of scrimmage and then also the second level too. He's just so loose as far as a mover, six foot three, 240 pounds. I just love the way he moves around. Everything is just so natural for him. He can be in a corner as far as if you want to blitz him off of the edge too. So he just makes so many plays in every which way possible. Is there, again, I didn't N'Kobe Dean would be another possible first round linebacker. He's not an option at 11. I don't know that he would, you know, unless they traded back, but how does he stack up to, to Lloyd? So the size is something that is a big right. difference between the two. Nicobe Dean at about five foot 11, 230 right. pounds is much different from Devin Lloyd at six foot three, 240. So the frame is much different, but as far as just the physicality that he plays with, I think that's the big difference between the two as well. Nicobe Dean is just so physical, whether he's stepping downhill and firing through the the alley uh, inside to stop the run, but also against the pass. I think he's very consistent in that area too. I think that's something that's kind of been knocked against him a little bit, but I just don't really see that on tape as far as how consistent he is. Uh, you don't want to live. You don't want him living a whole bunch in man coverage, even though I think he can hold up against running backs. But I think it may be a struggle a little bit if you ask him to go against those slot receivers. I don't think you want him living and dying doing that. So the big thing, and I think the big difference between the two, is that you probably want Nakobe Dean and more so of a three-four scheme of where you have those big okay. bodies in front of him that can right. take up space like he had at Georgia when he had Jordan Davis and Devontae Wyatt and Jalen Carter and all those big bodies in front of him just eating up those blockers so you can keep him clean and allow him to roam free. Whereas Devin Lloyd, I think he's a little bit more physical as far as being able to stack and shed at the point of attack. After the first round, Troy Anderson, Chad Muma, are those are those the two names that stand out at that position after the first round? Yeah, and I'll even add another Quay Walker who hey, was Quay beside, Walker's yeah, 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 yeah. He, beside Nicobe Dean. I, I think those three are probably your second round guys right now, and there's plenty of others that I like after that too. Where there's Channing Tindall, uh, who's probably more so of your third round guy. Um, there's plenty of others in this class, class too. Leo Chanel from Wisconsin is more of your big body downhill run stuffer type of linebacker. Brian Asamoah from Oklahoma is yeah. more of an athletic type too. And then if you're looking for a late round guy, maybe to just take a shot on, even though he's going to have to redshirt his first year. And I thought he probably was going to end up going in the second round, Damone Clark from LSU, oh, yeah, yeah. Who, who had the, the spinal surgery, unfortunately for him. So he's going to have to redshirt, but if you get the player that he was pre-injury, I think you can get a starting Mike linebacker. With Quay Walker, is he, do you think he's just more of an outside guy or can he play inside? 
I think he can do either one. He okay. can play Mike, he can play Sam, points. or he can play Will. Yeah, he just like he's him. just so athletic. I like him a lot too. He's just so athletic. And he is raw. I will say that he was only a one year starter when he was at Georgia, just because he has some really good players in front of him. But if you just if you're patient with him, I think you could turn out to get something from him. But I think that may make Washington a little hesitant, especially with what happened last year with Jamin yeah. Davis. So yeah, I, I don't think, know if they would be interested in Walker. I, yeah, and that's, I would agree with that. And that's why I look at Anderson and move. And Anderson's intriguing because he's played, you know, now you can look at it two ways. He's played a couple of different spots, which means like they had a hard time figuring out. On the other hand, you have to be really smart to play all those positions and then play what go to linebacker and play it like he did. Yeah, he's he's probably had the most interesting background story of any prospect in this draft class. He's played quarterback, he's played running back, and then he transitioned over and played linebacker. So Troy Anderson has just done everything in his career. You very rarely see players having that type of high 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 level success, especially on both sides of the football. Okay, and then last last thing, then I'm going to wrap it up and get to the offense. Is there a defensive player that you know, whether it's maybe on the line or somewhere else that you say like? This is a guy I really, really like, and it could be a late round guy that's like nobody's talking about him a lot yet, but this is the guy that I can't wait to see what he does. Um, I'll let you pick a position. What position? Do Defensive you think? line. That's a good one. Um, just trying to think of somebody right now. Because this I'll team go will need with, depth. This team needs depth. Yeah. Uh, they tackle yeah. and then and they want to get another young end. Yeah. So one I will name his name is Matthew Butler from Tennessee. I got an opportunity to see him at East West Shrine game. And he was one that really stood out. I thought he was one of the better players there. So he's probably more so of a fourth or fifth round guy, but Matthew Butler from Tennessee is one name that I think could come in and start at three technique or somewhere inside um, from day one, honestly. Well, Jordan, appreciate you talking about the defense. We wrap it up there. We're going to come back with a look at the offense for the next episode. So thanks a lot, Jordan. Absolutely. Everybody, it's John Kine. Do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, and I'll continue to bring you guests who provide excellent insight into the Washington Commanders. And while you're here, check out the other terrific content on the Empire Media Network, including Inside the Cap with Joel Corey and All's Caps with Steve Wino and former Washington Capital Carl Alsner. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button. Thank you.